We're up, ready to rock. Yes? Let's rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Green Rush Live, The Business of Cannabis. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. And I'm David Rabinovich, live from Syracuse. So we've got Syracuse, we've got the Boston area, and our first guest on this veterans show is Dana E. Shoked, who is the CEO of O2 Vape Company out of Michigan. Dana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, of course, even though uh, we are concentrating on veterans in the cannabis business, I got a press release from a mutual friend of ours, Tess Woods, and I mm -hmm. was intrigued with the angle of this story that the vape industry may not be able to get deliveries of their products in the next 30 days. Can you kind of explain how this ended up on a COVID relief bill and how it's going to affect the vape industry? Well, I, I most certainly would love to know how they tucked it into the 5,172nd page of a, uh, a stimulus bill that was supposed to help people you know, keep their homes and get paycheck uh, protection. And, you know, and instead they, they stuck this in, I believe at the 11th hour, and it's really going to have a massive impact on, on people being able to get their medicines on veterans, being able to get their medicines that might be using it for PTSD or to overcome some of their injuries that they may have sustained while serving their country. And um, I would love to know, because ironically last night, they ruled that you couldn't put in the minimum wage price right. increase into the stimulus package, but yet you just put something else into the stimulus package that had nothing to do with COVID relief two months, a month and a half ago. Well, we all know a month and a half ago, it was a little bit different environment. In this Washington, is true. Let's just this say. is true. Um, and, and there was all sorts of wheeling dealings uh, going on at the last minute of that COVID bill because they were all absolutely. Pressured. And I, you know, I'm not a big fan of how politics works, but I certainly recognize uh, how it works. Why do that? Why are they singling it out? I was I was reading a little bit about it, and it's a it has to do with a e-cigarettes to children's act that was in 1949, the Jenkins Act. I mean, so they took the, they, they took the correct they took the Jenkins Act and they modified it to include anything. And I don't have anything to you know to show you up here on my desk. Right now, I get my staff to get some stuff, but they um, they basically took that and they they modified it to include anything that you vaporize, no matter what form it's in, whether it be wax, shatter, CBD, essential oils, vitamins, anything. If you are putting it into something to vaporize it, they now have considered that to be a cigarette and are going to constitute people that do that and may not follow the rules properly, which are insane rules, that you'd become a cigarette trafficker. So they've now taken anything that has to do with vaping, a cartridge, a battery, a USB charger, a wall charger, because it says any accessories, any part thereof. I mean, if you read the wording, they have basically encompassed everything into that, that you can no longer ship them through the United States Postal Service. Okay, fine. A lot of people don't use the post office, but then immediately after that, FedEx came on board and said they were going to do it. Um, and then UPS came on board and said that they were going to do it. But the, the interesting part of the other two entities that are private, because the bill did not attack private entities. It was only going after that the United States Postal Service must must um, adhere to this, okay? Which they're in enough trouble as it is. They can't afford to lose any business, okay? And that's a huge loss for them. I mean, we, you know, ship a lot through them or used to, but not only that, you're talking about the, you know, the hemp bill and the, the hemp act. You know how many, we make hardware for a lot of CBD companies that obviously then ship their legally CBD oil through the mail that are helping people and veterans with PTSD and so on and so forth. And now they're going to cut that access off to them. But ironically, the way that UPS worded it is they said they would stop all vaping to, from, and within the United States. So they're stopping the importation, the exportation, or delivery within. Wow. David, you got anything? Because no, I was looking at the uh, at the press release. I mean, it, it is 
you, you know, it sounds like one of those, the, the law of unintended consequences. This was a likely e efforts to curb the vaping pro problems that we had last year that were not simply cannabis related. And unfortunately, cannabis has now got sucked into it. And they have got sucked into it. But, you know, <clears throat> also, too, part of the, the thing about the vaping crisis, and I use the air quotes, about that that happened that started literally actually it was what it was in the summer of 2019 uh, so it's almost two years ago when it was the vitamin e acetate that was going around in the cannabis but that that was all black market thc that really didn't have hardly anything to do with the legal dispensaries that o2 vape works with the legals the state the multi-state operators that we make hardware for but for them to hide behind and say that this is about the children it's really not about the children and even though i'm really not in the e-liquid or the e-nicotine side of the business you know, I have friends that have businesses that are about to lose everything because of the PACT Jenkins Act, because of the, the PMTA. This honestly is all about big tobacco. It's all about big tobacco and big pharma and pushing the small to medium people out. And because ironically, they're saying that if you can still ship through those purposes, if you have an FDA approved device through the PMTA, which is the pre-market tobacco act that they put into play. But the only people right now that have anything approved through the PMTA is RJ Reynolds and Philip Morris. So I have a question for you. Sure. How does, if I'm running a company, and, and by the way, I'm not a, let's put marijuana or cannabis aside for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan at all of vaping, like vaping nicotine and some of the other things that you vape. But how do those firms get their nicotine? I would think they have to buy from big tobacco. No, because tobacco is not nicotine. Nicotine is not tobacco. Nicotine is in tobacco, but they're not making, but nicotine is, a, is, is not from the plant. It's not, nicotine and tobacco are not the same thing. Okay. And I, you know, I'm sorry to hear that you say that you're not because it has saved, nicotine vaping has saved thousands, hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And, I, and, and it's just because you may not be educated enough because it's, you know, everybody pays attention to what's in their own world and what affects them, but it has saved, nicotine doesn't cause cancer. It's the tobacco and the tars and the chemicals that cause the cancer and the combustion. You're talking about most nicotine liquids are some flavoring and some vegetable glycerin or, or, or propylene, you know, PG, that's it. There's people who vape that don't even vape nicotine. The whole idea of it is you start off and you start off higher, you wean down on the nicotine and then it gets you to, and most people still, you know, like that, that feeling of it. So I have friends that vape zero. Yep. I have That's a staff zero. member that vapes zero. It's just flavor. They like the flavor. It still yep. gives them that feeling of inhaling and exhaling, but there's no nicotine. In them, but that's really where so. But I mean, you're talking about you can look at people who have you know maybe had bad lungs from smoking and look at their x rays and scans from prior to smoking to people that couldn't even run that now run. So it, it really is, it's not fair to compare even nicotine vaping to smoking, okay? Um, and there, there is a big industry for this now, and and the it's a multi billion dollar industry, right? But it's mostly mom and pops, and even for the small vape stores. The small, there was a study that came out that uh, for small businesses, brick and mortar vape shops had more employees in the 10 and under than any other industry in the, in the country. Yeah, I could believe that. Wow. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it came about because we've run through this locally um, near where Jimmy and I are at. Sure. And I think a lot of the problem was uh, vape shops were not being as tight as they should be and, and vapes with nicotine was showing up in high schools. It really wasn't even coming from the vape shops, to be fair, sir. It was really coming from more of the convenience stores and the 7-Elevens. But most okay. of the brick and mortar stores, they have age verification. Most of the people that ship online, even here at O2 Vape, we have age verification check on our website. You have to put in your social security. If they can't verify you, you have to upload your driver's license, your social security number. So even for our online presence, which we don't sell anything that contains anything in it. And for me, the way I feel here at O2 Vape is that I sell empty hardware off of my website, okay? And so to me, that's like buying a gun with no bullets or a car with no engine. <laughs> so you're not even selling the oils. You're not selling- I don't sell the oils. I am a hardware manufacturer and right. producer and distributor. 
So yeah. this is going to take me, which, so I make the hardware for the, the clients that we talked about that I have, you know, in Massachusetts and, and, and I worked with, you know, some of the original license holders in the state of New York. I made the hardware for one of the very first license holders in the state of New York when New York went medicinal. We have a ton of people that we make for in the state of Michigan. We have clients all over the country and in other countries. And if I can't get them their hardware, that they're going to be making the oil to put in it to then ship it to the dispensaries legally in their own state. We now have an issue of federal rights trumping the state's rights that people voted on and implemented in their state that they as a medical marijuana patient or as a uh, even as a recreational patient in the state of Michigan or New Jersey just went rec or Colorado, you have the right to consume that cannabis, whether it be in flour, concentrate, tinctures or edibles. By them doing what they have done, they have now taken that right away from states that say, I have the right to consume my medicine that way. Do you have any idea the legislators who were able to sneak that into the back? Diane end? Feinstein was the was in charge of it. Okay. Yeah. And I'm guessing you've contacted your own local uh, congressman. Working, and working on it. I mean, it really came out of nowhere. We, we got side, you know, we really got blindsided. It, it came out on what the 20th or was like the day before inauguration or something that um, the ex president signed it in the stimulus bill. And so it really came out. Of nowhere. It hasn't even been a month, to be honest. I mean, that this just came into effect. And so I have spoken with um, Dana Nessel, uh, the attorney general here in Michigan, um, so trying to work with her office and with our legislation here, but, you know, O2 Vape has been, um, you know, we're involved in some veterans. We give veteran discounts to companies. We work with other veteran owned organizations that have CBD companies. Um, I was involved in the last prisoner project. I'm donating to that. I'm involved with another company here, another brand, a couple brands in Michigan called Redemption and Driven Grow that every all the proceeds go to help a certain percentage go to help the last prisoner project. We just helped get uh, someone freed that was in prison, Michael Thompson here in Michigan that was in prison for almost 30 years uh, for great pot. That's a <laughs> so, great story. Yeah. And I was, you know, we helped in that. So we're very proud of that. And, you know, I'm proud that I'm a veteran owned company. I have veterans on my staff. As I said, we give veteran discounts. And this is a really big thing. And again, it's like, you know, as far as what it's going to do to, to brands that, that the other thing too, that's part of it for the online sales is suppose you're, you're a patient and you live in BFE, North Dakota, okay? Or yeah. Oklahoma, or even if you do live in a, in a very populated city such as Ann Arbor or New York, but you, and especially during COVID times, or maybe you only, you have a delivery service because delivery services is it, and you have, you have your medicine delivered to you, or you have your recreational vape delivered, but you're like, you know what? I don't like the vapes that they sell, or they don't sell any vapes, so they don't deliver them. So I want to go online to O2 Vape and get, and get a battery. Okay. Now I can't ship you a battery. Yeah, that does it, sound a little overreaching. It, it, I, I, it, oh, go, go ahead, David. No, no, go. Well, I, I just, I, I just wonder how you, we're going to get how the industry is going to get this rectified. You do know that they have another COVID relief bill that uh, you mentioned the minimum wage thing that they just ousted. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I would hope that they might be able to make a change on this next bill that hopefully we'll get passed. I mean, we all know right now, I the really, Washington DC is in, I could, can I call it a transitional time still? Sure. Because, but I don't even think to be honest, Jimmy, I don't think they really know what was in there because now there's a lot of senators and congressmen that are against vaping, but you cannot confuse. And as much as I do support any kind of vaping, if I am 18 or 21, and don't get me started about it being 21 to even smoke cigarettes. I'm eight, 18 years old. I'm old enough to go to war, vote for the president, die for my country, be in a foxhole, get married, have a credit card, buy a house, go into student loan debt, but I can't have the right to vape if I want or buy a pack of cigarettes. There's something wrong with that equation. Or even have a beer with your buddies, okay? Exactly. Because, with the, the, look, was, I don't know about you, but I moved into college on my 18th birthday when the drinking age was 18. And I did seem to graduate from that college and have had somewhat of a successful life up until now. Uh, but seriously, uh, needless to say, I didn't want to get you on the bandwagon, but you did. I too share that eight, it should be 18. We're not putting in enough money, research, whatever behind education of how to talk to young people 
about these products. And I'm talking about all these products, including caffeine, which is by far the most abused drug in our society, 91% of us get coffee in the morning in the United, in the world. You have, you have children drinking bangs. I agree with you. Bangs and these energy drinks that have more caffeine, 300 and some milligrams of caffeine in one of them. They're drinking two, three. We've had children die from caffeine, but please make no mistakes. Also, nicotine is about as safe as caffeine as well. So it's really not. But, but as far as for cannabis and, you know, what we do here at, at O2 Vape and, and, you know, we, we really do try to, you know, comply with all of the laws. And we will still try to comply and do our best to comply with the laws, whatever it is, and, and trying to find. But, you know, it's not just even really, honestly, if you read the law that you have, it's not just about a vape pen. It says anything. So you're talking about, I don't want to mention some big brands, but there are big brands that this is going to affect. They don't care if it's an oil, if it's dry flour, even. There's big brands out there that, that you can buy to buy, you know, a dry flour pen that or, you know, they use volcanoes, for instance, right. in a hospital. That is an electronic vaporizer. That is covered under that act. I, I'm, I'm sure you're a competitor with a certain company that has three letters in the name. You, you probably know, <laughs> right? am I right? Um, so I'm not going to mention it, but it, the, the, the last letter is near the end of the alphabet. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, that being said, are you, is there a vape industry association that is so i'm involved with the, the only one that i'm involved with is there is a there are some some have gone by the wayside but i am a, a member of the usva the united states vaping association and there are we do have there is a challenge to the pmta and some other things right now we hope it's going to get heard up to the supreme court <clears throat> we're at that supreme court level they did agree to hear parts of it um so we we have hopes for that <clears throat> that is a member organization only but you know, the regular vaping, I don't believe has, they don't really have the lobbyists. Of course, the tobacco industry does right. and the cannabis industry does. And I'm hoping that we can get some of the cannabis industry lobbyists behind this because you are talking about, you know, you're talking about, I mean, I'm not a small company by any means. And, you know, but I also give, you know, my employees health benefits and medical and dental and profit sharing and 401k. So I have employees that I'm worried about because of this. And are you, are you considered an MRB, a marijuana related business? I don't. And I don't know if they if they would consider me that. I, I mean, I think you could ask if they would consider me that in one point and another point, depending on who you're asking, they would say I'm not. Yeah. But it, it, look, we, we get classified that way and we don't touch the plant as a business anyway. Um, but because we take money from the cannabis industry, we are put into that category. And sure. I'm guessing... You, you I, have yes, I'll say for, that are in the so cannabis for, industry. For, so for that way, yes, correct. I mean, banking can be sometimes and exactly. So yeah. yes, so for that respect, yes. So what can people do to uh, help the cause or maybe uh, get the word out in, in some capacity for uh, the, the whole vaping association? I think people really need to get to whoever lobbyist, whatever industry people they have high up, whether it's NECA or somebody and get to their state reps, to their state Congress people. Because again, this is about trumping the state's rights, right? If my right says that I have that right, now they might say, well, you could drop ship it or you could this or whatever, but how am I gonna get the goods? When, we, when our stuff comes in from our factory, we inspect it all, we look at it, we make it, we ship, and then we ship it back out to our clients. Now you might be able to get some, some you know, private logistics companies and you can get a box truck come here, but the problem is not everybody has, buys everything that's on a pallet. So it's gonna be the smaller. What if I have someone who only has five boxes, 150 pounds? No trucking company is gonna come here for five loose boxes. Well, we, we do have a, uh, a Massachusetts state representative scheduled to come on in the next half hour with uh, Stephen Mandilli, who is a veteran, uh, one of the biggest cannabis advocates and is also a selectman in his town. Um, we'll, we'll at least share with him this, this information um, Great. because I don't think too many people know about it, to be honest. I really honestly do not think people do. And I mean, I really do not think that people know about it. I've gotten a couple of emails from some mailing lists that I'm on from some like that somehow they find me and they think I sell nicotine, which I don't. And they've said started to touch on it. But, you know, O2 Vape is really all about safety, 
all of our stuff is heavy metal tested. We have, we go through, we comply. We, you know, we were doing heavy metal testing and stuff and we use 304 stainless steel. We have all glass cartridges, all ceramic. We are all about health and safety here. Um, so, you know, I obviously, we don't, we don't have oil, we don't make it. So we rely on our testing from the labs when we send out something to the clients we are talking about in Massachusetts and things like that, that we make the hardware for, they get our stuff tested. So we are all about safety and compliance and we will continue. And it is an evolving industry. I mean, there's some new laws coming out in Colorado that I think are a bit, a little bit of a really, I don't think it's fair about the emissions of what you emit. Right. They're going <laughs> to, Colorado like, is going to be the first state to actually have emissions tests in the United States. Uh, and do that you, is do you, Test emissions we, we, from a cigarette? We know that that's not a good thing. But for the <laughs> vaping, this is the first time they'll be tasting that. I, I totally hear uh, some of the injustices that you're bringing up uh, for your industry. But it is 420, which is usually the time that we take our first break. So, uh, Dana, I want to thank, thank you, you for joining us uh, today and sharing your um feelings about this because it's going to really impact your industry. And uh, I, I think it is. That, that might be terribly unfair in a lot of ways here. So um, we'll, we'll, well if anyone, if I can do anything to help, you know, and through your interviews or is the state representative or whoever you've had on, but we need to get the word out to our state reps, to our attorney generals, because I have to report my sales to the attorney general offices. Now I can ship a handgun with way less restrictions than what I can for a $20 vape battery now. And so we need to get our attorney generals involved. We need to get our state reps involved and anything that I can do to help or people you want to put in contact with me, that'd be great. Or anybody that wants to contact the USVA and Jared Navarre, our attorney, or anybody like that, we need to um, we need to get that, or Travis Pinkerton, he is the, the president of the USDA. We need to get that going because it is going to have a big impact. And I don't know if people are just kind of sitting back waiting to see what happens, but we do need to, but O2 right. Vape would love to, you know, help and, and be involved in anything that we can, but All right. they're going to well, need to know. You got it, Dana. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here today on our Green Rush, the Business of Cannabis show. Uh, it is 420. That is usually the time when we light them up. Break. What's that? Light them up. It's 420. Light them up. Well, now, let me ask you a question, David. Do you know the origin of 420? Do you? No. Yes, I do. I usually orate it every time around this time. It, it started in San Rafael, uh, California, a bunch of high school kids called the Waldos. Used to meet across the street at the Louis Pasteur statue at 20 past four and catch a buzz out in the public until the law enforcement people picked up on that routine and then adopted that 420 call as public consumption of cannabis going on at the corner of uh, Main and Vine Street. And that became the, the, the code, the if you will. The cannabis the community then adopted it and embraced it and now celebrate April 20th and of course 20 past four it's on four. Friday. So we're gonna take our break now. We're gonna and I'm gonna to go, Shanty. I'm gonna go take a puff off of my O2 vape flip, plat, flip ultra there, or there the platinum go. that you can Good only plug. get here. You want to listen to Jonathan Edwards sing the song Shanty, though, because his song was my version of 420 when I was growing up. So enjoy that. We'll be back with our veterans show after this break. Don't go away. Yeah, this is a, a tune that uh, I wrote back in 19... <laughs> I've forgotten. We had a saying in our old old band, one of my first bands in 1966 or so, what are you going to do tonight? Oh, just, you know, like every other night, just going to lay around the shanty and put a good buzz on. Fix me something good to eat Make my head a little high Make the whole day complete Gonna lay around the shanty Oh, mama, and put a good buzz on I 
pass it to me, baby, pass it to me slow. We'll take time out to smile a little before you let her go. We're gonna lay around the shanty, oh, mama, put a good buzz on. On something, go ahead. Rick Brodsky, everybody. Nothing to do and there's always room for more Fill it light and shut up and close that door, baby We're gonna lay around the shanty, mama And put a good buzz on Take it, okay never works it's time to realize it it grows in my backyard it's time to legalize it we're gonna lay around the shed and mama and put a good buzz on My rented car. I'm gonna jam it into drive. I'm gonna head on out and play at WSCA with Sean. I'm glad I'm alive. We're gonna lay around the shanty, mama, and put a good buzz on every night and day. We're gonna lay around the shanty, mama, and put a good buzz on. PCM TV is supported by Salient Systems, a world leader in video management security, and by Revolutionary Clinics, a medical dispensary where the patient comes first, and by Accounting Buds, your number one CPA specialist for the cannabis industry. Take your Zoom call podcasts or webinars to a whole new level. Nurse Mark and the hey, Green hey. Nurse Podcast. Woo! We are here. What That's right. PCM can animate your logo, add eye-catching full-screen graphics, and lower third identifying motion graphics. Look like the network. Act like the network. Cannabis Media.
David, if you'd like to do that, you can. You want to welcome us back to the show? And we're back. <laughs> Very good, David. I'm going to train you into being a host sooner than later. Uh, that's big David Rabinovitz. I'm Jimmy big Young. Big. This is The Green Rush. And we are focused on veteran entrepreneurs and veterans in the cannabis business. And when it comes to that subject, I love to hear from Ann Brum from a joint venture and also uh, Stephen Mandilli, who is a regular, if you will, on our shows. I think he's been on almost every show we do. So we have them both here in the forum with us. Um, first of all, Ann, tell us a little bit about a joint venture. We are still waiting, by the way, on a representative to join us. But uh, Ann, fill up some time. Tell us a little bit about a joint venture and what you're up to. Sweet. Yes. Uh, Joy Venture and Co. Thank you very much, first of all, Jimmy and David, for welcoming uh, this conversation, which is important with veterans in the cannabis space and hemp space um, and the value um, of investing into veterans and um, their families as um, a part of our development of this industry, both plant touching and ancillary. So thank you very much for welcoming the conversation. It's always Great to uh, collaborate with you, Jimmy, and your team on <laughs> uh, being able to come up with some beautiful content and hopefully make an impact with all the viewers who are watching this live and on the, the reruns here. So um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Brum. I'm the CEO and founder of a um, small agency known as Joint Venture & Co. We're based in Massachusetts. Uh, and we serve the New England as a region. However, our campaigns have affected nationwide. Um, and we tend to focus on different uh, communication, branding, and initiatives. So anything to do with that, we tend to really want to uh, create, curate, and execute on. Uh, and I'm psyched to be able to have our colleague, Stephen, who um, is joining Joint Venture and has been since late 2020, uh, and he's really leading our front when it comes to our legislative and veteran affairs uh, and really offering amazing insight consulting for um, those areas of expertise. And I'm so thankful uh, to have had Stephen join the team. So thanks, Stephen, as well. And, uh, and Stephen, I think we have your representative friend, Michael Soder, with us. Uh, uh, at least I see him in the waiting room and now I see him on our forum room. So that's good. Uh, Representative Soder, thank you so, so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? How are you? Nice. So I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. David Rabinovitz is also in the room. He's with Mass Can and Can Adventure. Yep. But uh, yep. let's cut right to the chase, guys. <laughs> uh, I understand that there is a bill in the Massachusetts Senate that is going to actually define medical marijuana conditions for veterans. Is that accurate? Uh, so the bill, uh, th there's, there's one bill out there now. Um, it is, uh, has a docket number and everything. It is HD 323. Um, that bill will do three things. Uh, first, it will create a separate pathway for veterans to become registered um, in the medical cannabis program here in Massachusetts. And the two other things would be adding um, conditions to the list of opioid use disorder, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we believe that uh, putting those conditions out front uh, will help break stigma um, and, and also make sure people, you know, recognize those conditions and see them listed and, and then continue uh, seeking out help with medical cannabis. Um, I, as far as PTSD goes, we are the only New England state that does not have that listed on, on our medical program, which like, yeah, I see you shaking your head now. It, it makes no sense. No um, sense. I think there's only six out of the, I believe, 33 states now that have medical that also don't have that listed. So I think, you know, we should be ahead of the curve on that. Um, and the same, same with opioid use disorder. Um, you know, it, it, it Mar marijuana cannabis was given, you know, the title of being a gateway drug. Uh, I see it as an exit way drug it was for myself and thousands of other veterans um, in Massachusetts and even more across the country. Um, so if I can go back to the first part of that bill, we would create a new pathway. So this isn't 
looking to diminish or, or take away any any pass that a veteran might want. If they want to go seek a, a doctor and talk to a doctor, um, they can still do that. But for veterans that maybe uh, are uncomfortable going outside of the VA or have already um, you know, been a patient, they may see that, that they could handle it themselves um, you know, as there's not being any sort of uh, prescribed dose or anything like that. It's, it's really reliant on the veteran and knowing themselves and, and being the patient. Um, and, and this is something, you know, I, I've had the fortune of, of having a uh, state legislator um, that I, I've, I've known for years through my family, my mother, um, working at the Bellingham Town Hall for I think close to a decade now. Um, but Representative Soder has such a commitment to veterans. I mean, I'd, I'd hate to blow up his spot and say he has an open door policy for veterans because I don't want to flood his office. But I mean, he cares about his constituents and not only cares to listen, but cares to follow through with action. And um, I approached him about this and, and wanting to tell my, my sisters and brothers in arms, um, you know, that are facing so many problems right now. We have a, a, a veteran suicide crisis. We have a veteran overdose crisis. And I'm just out of desperation, just looking for things that, that are helpful. And cannabis with having no overdose deaths uh, reported in history um, and being a lot safer than a lot of those other medications, you know, I wanted to make it as accessible as possible. And, you know, on top of working with Representative Soda, I've had the fortune of working with um, Anne and Joint Venture Co. and some other organizations that, that are really dedicated to veterans issues. And we did a year long study back in 2019, which feels like decades ago now. Um, along with we, our, along with PhD, Dr. McNabb as well. Yep. And, um, you know, we, we surveyed veterans and we want to know, you know, what's the barrier to, you, to your access? And, you know, we, we took that information and now we're trying to remove those barriers. The top barriers were uh, cost of product, availability of product, cost of getting a card, and also owning a firearm. Uh, those were the top five. And we also have a, a second bill in the House um, that is HD 703 which is an act preserving second amendment rights for medical marijuana patients. Um, so it's something very important as a patient, as someone that's trying to heal, you shouldn't have to give up constitutional rights to do so. Um, you know, there may not be any activity now for anyone trying to do anything, but uh, in the past in Hawaii, um, they worked with federal uh, agents and um, money and resources went to helping um, bus people for, for cannabis. So we're looking to to be able to stop that before it happens um, and say, why don't we do that? Um, and, and all these these bills are, you know, not trying to to reinvent the wheel here. So I've done research on a lot of different states and trying to find the, the best of of what's going on now. And we're just we're just piggybacking on that. And, I, you know, these seem like things that you would think are automatically done, but it, it, you've got to do the research and be aware of what's going on. And uh, I want to help other veterans um, to do that. And that's why I've joined um, Anne and Joint Venture & Co. to be able to, to, to guide veterans on, hey, you have this ability. We all have this ability. I mean, even if you're not a veteran, you're a constituent. You have elected officials. Um, they work for you. If you don't reach out to them, they have no idea what you need. So just really trying to help, um, you know, educate and, and inform other veterans on this process, because I feel like these bills should be in every state. And that only happens by residents in those states bringing them forward. Well, and their representatives, like our representative Soda yeah. here today. <laughs> let's let's bring in our representative here. What an intro for you, Representative Soda. <laughs> uh, I believe you're from the Worcester. You represent the Worcester area. Is that accurate? Uh, eighth Worcester district, which is uh, Blackstone, Bellingham, Uxbridge, and Belling uh, Blackstone, Bellingham, Millville, and Uxbridge. Um, that's the eighth Worcester district, uh, in the, uh, state legislature. And, um, it's great to be teaming up on these bills. And, um, it's also great that I am going to be on cannabis policy. Um, uh, Steve is going to have a friend on the committee, uh, for cannabis policy. So it's actually very good. And, uh, Steve's a great advocate. Um, I have to tell you, I've done a, a complete 180. Um, from when Steve and I met uh, first uh, back, uh, was it Steve, six years ago, maybe. Um, and uh, 
Steve has uh, shown me a path that uh, uh, is um, very, very uh, important, not only to our veterans, but to uh, mo most importantly, to cannabis policy with our veterans. And that's what we have to uh, focus on. So you said you're on the policy committee in the state house. Is that? Yeah. Cannabis you? policy. Yep. yep. And um, yep. who else can you share? Who else is on that committee as far as representatives? So, so the new chair is um, the new chair for that committee is Dan Donahue. Ranking minority member is um, uh, uh, representative Frost from Auburn. And I'm going to be joining uh, in the minority uh, representative Frost. I believe uh Rep uh, State Senator uh, Sanchez Diaz is on that committee also. Um, so, we, you know, we, we've got some new um, new thought process going into this committee, and I think that's good for everybody. Um, I just reached out to uh, the chairman um, uh, today and um, told him that I'm excited about working with him. And uh, we need to, um, you know, I think you know, we have to approach cannabis in a way that um, is uh, we ha we have to look at cannabis in a way that is so much different than what we all think it is, I guess. You know, I guess that's the way we have to retrain um, our thought process on it, you know, and um, I think that Steve has brought that to the forefront with me. Um, we talk constantly um, and, uh, I think that we can actually get some things done. And I think, you know, the bills that we put forward, um, have some, uh, ground to stand on, which is, I think is, is what everybody wants when we're, uh, filing legislation at the beginning of the session. Okay. David, um, are you ready to jump in here? Not, not yet, Jimmy, you keep going. <laughs> I, I want to I want to know where the pushback is, uh, Representative Soto. I really want to know how in the world at this point, we're eight years into the medical program in Massachusetts. OK, and I've been a card carrier for since its inception, um, but I never had to worry about PTSD and go through the opioid uh, withdrawal situation that Stephen's gone through. Uh, where, who's, who's fighting this against you? That's what I want to know. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, there were people like me who probably fought against it early on, you know, and then as you, you have to, you know, one thing I learned about life in general is you have to look at every um, issue and take into account every issue. And I think the problem is that there's still are some people up there uh, in Boston that just need to really just kind of listen to the facts about this. And um, I think that's where the problem is. I think some people want to placate to a certain group um, and they don't um, want to give in so easily to the whole process of this. Um, but, you know, you got to look at everything from a, a 10,000 foot perspective. You can't just look at everything from a standard of just that, well, this is what I believe in. You're not very going to change my mind. You can't do that. And we still have some of that up there. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of feelings about this and, you know, there's going to be things that I'm going to be looking at uh, from a cannabis policy perspective, you know, one of the things that, and I haven't discussed this with Steve yet, but, you know, we got 18 year olds and 19 year olds and, and whatnot going into the military that we have no problem sending them to war. Right. Um, but, you know, and if we send them at a very young age, we say, oh, it's okay to uh, handle some of the most uh, sophisticated um, weaponry. arsenal weaponry yeah. that yeah. we have in our, uh, in the world. But, you know, when they kill or, you know, when they come back from that battle, we can't say, well, you're 18 and 19 and you're, you know, you've been in war, you've been there, you've been doing what you got to do. The country asks you to do what they're going to do, but 
you know what? You can't do this because you're not 21. Yeah, I, I, I happen to agree with you on a lot of that, but I think they, there should be a line in the sand. I went, I lived when we had the drinking age at 18 and somewhere between 78 and um, 81, they upped it to 21. And I was, I, it happened while I was in the middle of it, but it didn't impact me. And I get right. some of that, but I, I, I buy into the, if you, if you're a veteran and you go off to war, you come back, you deserve additional rights, right? You of course you do. It. Right. If you're you, you're honorably discharged, that the the 18 should be the, the age for you. If you are old enough to go into the military and you went and you served honorably, you sh- everything else should be open to you when you come back. I can see keeping it at 21 above beyond that for people who don't serve. But in I the think private sector. Yeah. Right. right. If you're going to make that step and serve and uh, and serve honorably, you shouldn't come back and be told you're too young. Right. I, I, I agree with that. And, and that's kind of what I feel about this is that, you know, um, you know, when we look at the opioid addiction and we look at the um, opioid crisis, you know, um, you know, I think a lot of it starts with these painkillers and these uh, Oxycontin and all this stuff. It starts there. And when you think about cannabis in the sense that what it can do without an addiction um, result, because there is no re- addiction result. I'm convinced of that. Um, uh, I think that we need to seriously take a look at that. And especially those that are serving at 18 uh, for our country and will put their lives on the line for our country. Um, you know, um, I mean, God, look at this pandemic. I mean, <laughs> The pandemic from a sense of like, okay, let's open every liquor store in the world and not, you know, but we're going to restrict marijuana facilities. Do you know what that did to the psyche of the people that rely on cannabis from a medical standpoint, from a, from a, just a personal standpoint? And a lot of people don't like the stigma of the medical aspect of it. So they have their car to go to the private end of it, which is the you know, the, 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 um, dispensaries. So they don't have to register and do what they got to, you know? So I I just, I I think that I've evolved on this issue. Um, I believe in natural, um, ways of healing and natural ways of, of, of putting things in our body. And, and quite frankly, I mean, Steve, from a standpoint of Steve, when we first met, I mean, I know Steve and I know Steve's family. And um, the great thing about that is that, you know, there's a lot of things that we, um, you know, when you listen just to Steve's story, there's a thousand other people like Steve, millions of other people like Steve. I was going to say, who have, probably hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, <laughs> that have given their life to their country. And, you know, quite frankly, I think we need to um, look at this. And it's something we need to look at. And I wish the federal government, to be honest with you, I think a lot of this stuff could be resolved. If the federal government just could make the move to acknowledge that cannabis um, has some benefits and, right. and make it accessible and easier um, so states don't have to struggle and people within states don't have to struggle and we could lower the cost of this if the federal government would just take the barriers down uh, on this. And, you know, we'll see. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not to get political or anything, but I think President Trump wanted to do that. But I think there were certain people in the party that forced them not to do it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm maybe I'm hoping that President Biden will look at this from a perspective of, hey, we need to finally do this. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we'll see. I mean, that, that would help us tremendously, um, for, especially for those that, you know, even with the, te- you know, even with the mat- medical marijuana, you know, um, tax, you know, forgiveness or whatever you want to call it, that you don't have to pay the taxes or the tax discount. Mm-hmm. It's still very expensive for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it forces us to, if you can't afford it, go and buy it from places that are not, I don't want to say regulated, but are regulated. And 
we don't want that. You know, we want to be able to help these folks get the right product, know what's in this product. These are people, especially veterans. I mean, they have given so much, given so much. Steve has given so much. His family has given so much. His wife has given so much. His mom, his everybody gave so much just in that one instance and multiply that times hundreds of thousands um, that have. And um, like I said, I have evolved on this. Um, Steve knows I've evolved on this and, um, and it's because of Steve. And uh, uh, we're, we're, this was an important committee uh, that I requested to be assigned to um, because I think there should be a Republican conservative approach um, to get our side on accepting this. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what I want to do. Yeah. yeah this so, is you know, such... It's interesting you brought up a political party because yep. if you look at the latest research on who is out there that is supporting federal legalization, again, mm-hmm. party lines. And mm-hmm. I, I appreciate the fact that you are willing to look at the science and the research. And I think Ann mentioned uh, Dr. Marion McNabb, who's a friend of us all here, um, and has spearheaded a lot of the research and, and the pro-cannabis movement out there. Let me ask you a question as a representative. Who comes mm-hmm. in to educate you about this product? Steve. <laughs> <laughs> in his spare time or what? I mean, uh, well, and you know, data. I, I mean, right. I'm, I, I, uh, you know, there's a benefit, uh, you know, uh, you know, I have friend, uh, Steve's a friend and yeah. it's a benefit. Um, and when I talk to other Republican colleagues and I talk to, you know, a lot of colleagues, you know, I, I talk about Steve's, um, struggles and I talk about that and that that's what got me to change and, um, and how I evolved on it. And, from a standpoint of, you know, um, facilities and things like that, um, you know, it's something that you just got to look at and I'm going to be straight up. I, I, I don't, I haven't used, um, medical marijuana bombs and creams and things like that, but I've got some personal, um, struggles health wise. And I've used CBD to the legal limit that you can sell over the counter without, licenses and all that stuff, but it's, um, I don't want to take painkillers and I don't want to do those things because I know what it does to the human body. Um, and, um, you know, I talk to my doctors about these things, but it's hard because the doctors don't want to deal with say, it. And, right. you know, and, and there's a stigma with that, right. You know, Doc- there doctors really is. Don't, doctors don't even want to deal with it at all. Okay, right. including my own PCP, who I have an issue with about this, and we get into it <laughs> during my annual physical. He does not like it when he has to, whatever. Um, yeah. So, but again, are you reading about the research? Are you proactively learning about the benefits of the plant? Because there's been so much research done in the last two years, and I'm I try to absorb as much as I can, but you know. I know you're friends with Steven. I know you rely yep. on Steven. And yep. Steven's story yep. is so compelling. And I, Steven remembers the day I met him, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. It was a, day, a historic day in Massachusetts. It was the first adult use recreational day at Captivate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I heard his story, it, it just, it boils my own blood when I get, when I hear these stories about veterans, especially being denied or having to come off opioids, easy to get Oxycontin at the VA, but you can't get a little weed. I mean, it just makes no sense in so many, so many ways to me. Yeah. Uh, But I keep going back to, are you following the science and research that's been uh, out there and available online uh, every single day? I get another survey and another research story. Yeah. And and, and I am. And I am. Uh, I I am. Um, I'm out there doing what I got to do. Look at it. I am all about research. I'm all about investigating it. I'm all about looking at it. I'm open minded to all of it. Um, I think there's something to be said about this. And I think there's something to be said about tying this into opioid addiction. And if we can use cannabis in a way 
to um, exit. get folks off of, yeah, exit off of opioids. You know what? We all win. We absolutely right. all win. Um, even taking and left. that's what we I have mean, to do. Good even statement. taking less, you know, being able to take three or four less pills a day, you, you, the, the, what opioids do to your insides, just alone that you can get a disorder just from opioids to, mm. uh, uh, you know, with, with constipation and stuff like that. And, and those things are, are huge. But I just wanted to say, like, this is completely a, a bipartisan issue, um, you know, helping veterans. Um, delivering on on the government side of the contract for for what we signed up for, you know, like this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, saving lives and keeping families together um, mm -hmm. is it, it, it crosses all party lines. Like it shouldn't matter. And and I, I it, Mike uh, Representative Soda will admit that that all of his chem turnaround came from education. And I was very intimidated at first. You know, I'm like, all right. Um, you know, the view from, from my side was, you know, it, it's a, it's a liberal thing for cannabis. So I gotta, I'm, I'm one of the few people in the state where both my Senator and my representative are Republican from the other side of the party. I, this is something I can't just throw my hands on and be like, Oh, we're not gonna be able to work together. It's like, no, we gotta find a way to work together. And that has been one of the most important things is, is, is educating and just informing them and, and both, um, uh, Representative Sona and Senator Fatman here have both done 180s, and I, I you know, they, they'll credit me. I, I feel like all I did was deliver a message. You know, like I didn't discover this. This is this is a message that has been out there. And like he's saying, you know, we we got the wrong education on opioids from the industry, saying there was no risk, so you're good. And on the, then we got the wrong education from cannabis. Is this is deadly? This is devastating. Um, and no one should have access to it. There's no benefits. So, you know, we all kind of got duped here. So it's mm. on us to, to really educate ourselves. And like, um, like Representative Soder was saying, uh, there, there's tons of resources out there now. Like you can look at, at peer reviewed studies. You can look at research. You can look at and, our study at cannabisadvancementseries.org. Yes. That is 2019 and had veterans from 48 states uh, participate and give feedback and share um, everything about it. So yeah. you can also refer to that, but also as civilians being informed in the power of our voice and being a constituent and working with our local municipalities and local legislators um, at a state level, Representative Soder, what advice do you have? I know we have a couple minutes left for I, I'm a child of veteran. I've a brother-in-law who's serving overseas actively. I have in-laws that are veterans, but for us that are looking to support and enrich and understand uh, and know that these pieces of legislation are out there, what can we do um, to help support and move um, the support? Well, to move, I was going to say the needle in the right direction. That's not what I want to say, but uh, to help these initiatives make a systemic and sustainable um, impact? Well, I think education and talking to the reps and talking to all of us up there is key and, and bringing um, the uh, points and driving home the points is, is essential. And I think, you know, Steve is a, is a great advocate for that. Um, but, you know, Steve needs a lot of help from a lot of other veterans too that believe in what he believes in. So I think that would be the key that we need to focus on. Um, I think uh, with this new leadership uh, and Chairman Donahue coming in, um, I think you're going to see some different changes coming in. And um, I think you're going to see a lot of um, progress coming forward uh, on, on cannabis. So and, and we can awesome. provide public testimony, we can write in, we can offer a video, yep. we can email. So we understand it's a process, a 13 step process to be exact. Uh, yeah. You know, two year legislative period. So the bills just the deadline was on February 19th here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We know that it's going to be about two years and there's like this influx of hurry up and then we wait. And then this yep. hurry up and wait and to participate and support. 
Yeah. And I, and I, and you're not going to be honest with you. The pandemic doesn't help with any of this. Um, and, um, but I think, you know, I think when Jim and Donahue sees that he's got some Republican support and bipartisanship, I think that helps with a lot of things to moving things forward. So, um, and, uh, that's what we hope for. So, and that's what we're going to keep advocating for. All right. Well, Representative Soder, I uh, so appreciate totally up to you. What we do now on this show is if you want to stick around and hear from other veterans that we have lined up. I, but you I have can't a very busy because, schedule. Yeah, <laughs> I can't because today is my uh, one of my final days for accepting uh, co-sponsorships. And I'm doing that as we're talking. So if I could, <laughs> I would love to go finish that. But um, thank listen, you, guys you for gotta, that. You, we thank you. You got You guys, you you folks have a friend and. Uh, and Steve is a, a is a good man, and um, we're we're ready to fight with you. Okay. There you go. Thank, Thank you very you much, now. Representative Michael Thank you. Soda. Appreciate Thank you. it, Thank Massachusetts you. Uh, State Representative. We are going to take a break here at the top of the hour. When we come back, I'm I know Ann is going to be here. We're going to be joined by a couple of guys from the Patriots Helping Vets organization and Roland Cordova from You Grow Rentals. He's calling in from uh, pretty sure he's in Las Vegas. So. Uh, we continue with the Green Rush, the business of cannabis after this break. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Ben Shower, New England rep for Salient Video Management Systems. Let me tell you what makes us different in the security space. We're your trusted advisors for all your security needs. I know how complicated the regulations are in cannabis, and working with Salient Systems will be the polar opposite of that. I give free consultations and we'll walk you through every step of the process so that you can get what you need at the price you can afford. We're robust, we're simple and scalable. We're Salient Systems, your solutions to all your security needs. Please contact me at the information below and I'm looking forward to being your trusted advisor. PCM TV is supported by Salient Systems, a world leader in video management security, and by Revolutionary Clinics, a medical dispensary where the patient comes first, and by Accounting Buds, your number one CPA specialist for the cannabis industry. Absolutely. 280E, it's only a few lines in the tax code but it drives the entire accounting function in cannabis companies. Uh, it's very specific and there's a lot of rules and regulations that go along with that. You have to account for your inventory in certain ways. Um, it's not just purely how you do taxes. There's a lot of pieces of the equation in accounting before you even get to the tax calculations that you have to do correctly in order to be able to even deduct anything. Um, 280E, for those that don't understand, that aren't familiar with it, really relates to what you can and cannot deduct for cannabis businesses. And the short answer is there's not much that you can deduct on the strict reading of 280E, although there are some court cases out there that help cannabis companies a little bit. Take your Zoom call podcasts or webinars to a whole new level. Nurse Mark and the hey, Green hey. Nurse Podcast. Woo. We are here. What That's right. PCM can animate your logo, add eye-catching full-screen graphics, and lower third identifying motion graphics. Look like the network. Act like the network. All right, welcome back to the Green Rush, the, the last 60 minutes of this show. And this is usually the time when we open up the forum and welcome in pretty much as many people as we possibly can that have the link into our show. Um, I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Canvas Media. And Rabinowitz, his sidekick. There you go, my sidekick. I love that. That's crazy. But uh, yeah. David is with us. And we are joined, we're focusing on veterans 
and entrepreneurship and the role that cannabis and the cannabis industry has played in this. And there's so much passion in this room right now. I'm, I'm really just going to kind of take attendance here a little bit and make sure everybody who we think is in the room is in the room, introduce everybody a little bit. And then um, the easiest way to do this is to actually call on you uh, to give yourself a little background about what you do and, and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna try, try and, kind of try and play moderator here. Um, but I know Ann Brum is still with us. Stephen Mandilli is still with us. And we welcome in Max Piergalini. Did I do it right, Max? Yep, very well, thank you. Thank you, Tom Rand is with us, Tom Rand. Yep, how are you okay, doing? there with Patriots Helping Vets. Uh, Roland Cordova is with us. Roland, how are you? Couldn't be better, Jimmy, how are you? Good, nice to finally kind of see you. <laughs> Same here. All right, and I do believe, did we get, is Stanley Atkins with us as well? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Stanley Atkins is here as well. And, uh, we're, and we brought back Dana Shockett She's the CEO of O2 Vape. And I'm, I'm going to start with Dana because I'm going to ask her to make it really quick. And okay. please let this room know what the vape industry is facing in the next 30 days. Because even Stephen admitted he didn't understand. He didn't recognize the fact that, oh, my God, you're not going to be able to ship your products because of this um, little clause Correct. that was snuck in the last COVID relief bill. So uh, Dana, I'm going to give you a, a minute and a half here okay. to kind of tell a little bit about what's going on and then we'll go into our discussion. Is that okay? Sure, sure absolutely. So uh, thank you, Jimmy. As you said, I'm the owner, president, and CEO of O2 Vape. I've been in the industry for eight years. Uh, I am a veteran as well. Started this out of my garage and have grown it to one of the, the premier um, manufacturer hardware producers for the cannabis and CBD industry. Um, they stuck a bill in. Diane Feinstein, I believe, was the sponsor of it. There are other senators that did sign on to it as well, um, but she was the spearhead of it, where they took a 1940-some act called, called the Jenkins Act, and they modified it and then also brought in the PACT Act, which is the Prevention of Online Cigarette Trafficking Act. So they have now classified anything that is a vaporizer, anything. And that is whether it is a, and I'm going to name drop, even though I don't want to name drop some of my competitors, whether it's a PAX, a Puffco, a Volcano, a Da Vinci, anything that you are vaporizing or that any component or part thereof that you are putting anything in and they specifically laid out whether it is CBD, THC, essential oils, vitamins, nicotine, anything that you now fall under this, whether it's empty or non-empty and any accessory or part thereof. So even like the vape charger that sell that comes with that we sell, the little micro USB charger is now considered a cigarette. And you are now not allowed to ship your products through the United States Postal Service. But unfortunately, the other entities that everybody might use, the two other big ones, FedEx and UPS, have also signed on to it. So for a CBD company that is then selling and shipping, maybe it's in my hardware, and they've filled it with their oil and they're shipping. We, we have a huge client down in North Carolina that is a veteran owned hemp company and they do nothing but CBD and we can hardly keep him in hardware. That's how much vape uh, CBD products are selling, but it's drastically gonna hurt the vape industry. So like the veterans haven't been hurt enough, by the way, um, exactly. when it comes to access. Now, now you're gonna take the vape hardware away from them. Um, yep. So I wanna start, um, let me go to um, uh, Max. Max, you out there? Yes, sir. When you hear that they're going to shut down the, the vape shipping industry, basically not allowing, how do you, what, what, I don't know if you do vape, so, if you do smoke or what you do, <laughs> but how difficult is it going to be for you to maintain uh, use of medicine? It, it's, it, you're going to push people to the black market. Exactly. <laughs> the, 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 the plain and simple, you're going to push people to the black market. You know, vaping for, for some people, some people can't smoke because of the, the heaviness, I guess I'll call it. Yeah. Um, and, and to remove things like a PAX and a volcano, which I know gets used on it for a medical basis, you know, mm -hmm. on a daily basis to, to have that gone is just. 
Well, but the other the, the thing that I talked to talk to Jimmy about is that from the e-commerce side, so we do we have a, our, our business per, per se is we have about we have a lot of veterans that come on our site. We give a military discount off of our site, and they're just buying the empty hardware. They might have a delivery service that brings them their medicine, but they buy the battery from us or the cartridge or our wax pen or our dry herbal pen, whatever it is. But if I also have about seventy percent of our business is to the people who make the wax. Who, who grow the flour, who grow, who make the oil. So I, they're buying, you know, Massachusetts is a huge state for me, huge state. I work with a lot of the big players in mass. They get their hardware from us. They sell our hardware. They sell, they're not going to be able, I'm not going to be able to ship them their stuff. All right. Hang on. Hold on, Dana. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Let's get Tom Rand uh, from Patriots Helping Vets in there just to kind of chide in on this as well, Tom. Uh, uh, more difficulties for access to medicine and titration, like you guys don't have enough working against you, right? Right. I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the laws and the rules of the vaping industry and all that. Um, my, I think at Patriots Up and Vets, we, we just help veterans for free. If you need to start growing or you need some meds or whatever, we get it to you and uh, we help. Um, uh, unfortunately a lot of the guys um do go to the black market because uh that's one of the few things that we don't provide a lot of is the vape because of the um how hard it is to get a hold of them right. i mean we, we we survive on donations so for us it's a lot easier with just the flour concentrates and other things like that for the guys versus the vapes because like you say they, they cost money to, right. to produce so I feel bad for the guys that use it. I know quite a few of them that use it because of the work that they're in. They can't be, um, you know, firing up and taking smoking a joint, but they do have a couple hits off the vape, whether CBD, THC, whatever, it helps them get through the day. Right. Now you're telling me that they're not even going to be able to, it's going to be harder for them to obtain that is, it's kind of very discouraging, to be honest with you. Oh, it, it, it should piss you off, basically. I'm going to tell you yeah. that right now. Um, PatriotsHelpingVets.org, by the way, is, is your website. I want to make sure I get a plug in for you. Roland Cordova, tell us about what you do, where you're from, and what is You Grow Rentals all about? Because I know, but I want you to share it with everybody in the room, if that's okay. It'd be my pleasure. Um, Jimmy, we actually have two companies, but You Grow Rentals are state licensed, grow facilities for individuals that have a, a license to grow their six plants in California, um, organically, inexpensively, uh, and strain specific. So depending on what their problem is, we are going to allow them to have a place away from their home to grow their plants. And then what we do uh, is we extract it and make it into an oil for them to use however they want. But it's all medicinal. We don't deal with recreational. Um, we deal only right now, all of our employees are veterans. Um, we have another company called Veterans Cannabis with a Z.org that um, our Navy SEALs, top of the line doctors in cannabinoid medicine from the American Cannabinoid Clinics. Um, and so what we do is we mentor our veterans into the, and train them in the cannabis industry and then have a job for them waiting when they get out. Got it. There you go. See, he's, he's doing the right thing. I, I love that. Um, Stanley Atkins is out there. I, I've seen him patiently waiting and we haven't called on him. So I, I'm going to call on Stanley to tell us a little bit about the Stanley group and what you're doing and what's your background. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Stanley Atkins II. I am the CEO and founder of the Stanley Group. Um, it is a business consulting and management firm. So I'm currently partnered with several clients here in the state of Georgia who are actively uh, pursuing a cultivation license for the cultivation and production and dispensing of low THC oil. 
Um, I started a platform years ago known as The Canamedic. So those who follow me on social media know me as The Canamedic. I'm a retired uh, firefighter paramedic. And when I got into this space, it was due to my own health issues. And I realized that we didn't have legislation on the books. There was no one that looked like me who was down at the Capitol um, advocating not only for patients, but also for veterans. Um, I served two deployments, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom. And the way I really found my niche in the industry was I saw that there was a significant disconnect between the correlation of technical information and the lay person who needed it. You know, you had a lot of these physicians and business owners throwing these big words and endocannabinoids out there and people just couldn't relate. So I've had the, the profound uh, opportunity to work with companies all over the country. I've actually spoken in Boston um, on the main stage at the Boston Freedom Rally back in, I think that was 2018. I just got back from Las Vegas for uh, an, a two-day event we had out there. And I'm here today to really um, give my input as far as veterans, um, businesses, and the way the industry is going. Because the way the industry was isn't the way the industry is. And I saw the O2 vape um, logo behind her. I saw the stand up behind her. I was on a, I was invited to a cannabis uh, business pitch last summer. And there was someone from O2 Vape on there talking about their hardware. And it was hands down the best conversation I've ever heard anyone give in regards to the physical production and the content of the hardware. You know, you have a lot of cannabis brands that are upset that things uh, don't pass testing or things are outside of parameters. Well, a lot of people look at, well, we know we made this good oil. We cut it with this good solvent. What happened? Your hardware. What, what, what type of metals? Is it ceramic? Did it come from China? Did it, where did it come from? You know, where is the quality control? So I've been had the, I've had the opportunity to work with lots of brands in the industry, lots of physicians. I recently just wrapped up a two day of medical town hall event with the Morehouse School of Medicine and the Satcher mm -hmm. Health Leadership Institute. Wow, that's great. Oof. I love that. And I love it when uh, people can kind of reconnect. We miss the conventions, people. Do we not yeah. miss the conventions? Yeah. I think we all agree that, uh, and, and especially a, a cannabis convention, you know, the, the plant itself, to me, brings people together. It always has. Even, even when, uh, wink, wink, we did it around the corner. Now that it's legal, we're out. We're talking about it. We still miss that camaraderie um, and the ability to share ideas and the passion for this industry. So I, I'm hoping um, as the vaccinations slowly roll out and get into people's arms, we're gonna see uh, the end of the year. Um, I'd love to see everybody in Vegas uh, happy again in, in also, December, right. right? No, it's actually moved this year. Uh, they moved it uh, earlier, October. it's in the fall, right? It's in October this year, so yeah. Right, absolutely. I think they're, they may end up sliding it, but. Let's not let's not tell Chris Walsh what to do. OK, um, the only person I don't think I've introduced and he was with us, I'm pretty sure before is Ryan Cohen. Ryan, you're out there, right? No, nope, we have Will, though. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I thought Ryan was out there. Who's out there? Tell me who it is, David. You know who it is. No, nope, we on the very bottom here. We'll see. We'll see. We'll hey, see. Guys, How'd you get into this room? I snuck in, man. <laughs> Tell us who you are and why you're here. So my, my name is William Carroll, uh, former Navy veteran, uh, yeah. working right now with Roland Cordova on the veterans cannabis side. So he's running the UGRO side and I'm doing the veterans cannabis side. So I'm his counterpart. So Got he it. forwarded me the invitation to get on here to speak, whatever you guys need me to speak to. Oh, great. I want to know where you are because you look like you're in somewhere sunny outside and a yeah. lot warmer than Michigan. Yeah, I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Whatever. Oh, <laughs> Everybody in the room from New England, we just go, oh. I know, I'm sorry. I'm from Maine, though, so I know your pain. All right. We're yeah. in Maine. Got to ask you. We're in uh, Maine. Blue Bay Harbor. Oh, nice. love it. Um, Spruce Point Inn. I, yeah, I do know that. I've been there a few times. So, so I, I spent 11 years in Maine, probably before you were born, doing sports in the <laughs> 80s, let's just say. What'd you um, do in the Navy, Will? I was in a Navy SEAL. Oh, you were the Navy SEAL. Wow. All right. Wow. I got to tell you, everybody in this room, I don't understand how in the world, especially with the divisiveness that this country has gone through, if we can't agree on helping our veterans, we are never going to advance as a humanity. Okay? Yeah, I just don't... The, the, the politics, the, the labeling, the political parties... 
it just drives me nuts when it comes to this issue that you can't go to the VA and even talk about medicinal marijuana. Stephen, um, going back to Stephen Mandeli here, because, mm -hmm. you know, we know your story, but I'm not so sure everybody in this room knows your story. Would you be willing to share what you went through and how you got off your opioids? Sure thing. Um, so my story isn't unlike so many other veterans. Um, got deployed, uh, was, was injured um, on duty, spinal cord injury, um, you know, went from base to base, from hospital to hospital. Uh, being told different things. Um, each hospital and each each doctor visit got another pill of uh, of more bottles, um, and that led me down a, a path um, at the VA when I got home of uh, of ten years and fifty seven different medications, including eight different opioids. Over that time, I uh, was told, you know, oh, don't worry, we have we have a, a, a formulary full of thousands and thousands of medications we'll find the right one for you and, and, you know, everything will be all right. So, you know, it was 10 years of that. Um, at, at first I felt the effects of feeling different uh, shortly after that. It wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't care anymore that I felt different. I just thought, okay, this is it. I'm doing what my doctors tell me, you know, they've told me to mourn who I was before, you know, I'm not gonna be able to have the job that I had been um, aiming to have my entire career and and trying to then you know readjust uh, direction to go um but on all those medications i i couldn't think any other way but being angry at everything um and, and that just snowballed like i said it was, it was 10 years and uh at, towards the 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 end of the that period of time you know i had um daughter was born second daughter was born then i start getting hit with what can i teach my kids i'm at home every day taking all these medications. I, I, I'm, I'm not a successful member of society. I, I don't know what to do. And that led to um, a suicide attempt. I uh, tried swallowing a handful of my Xanax, Percocets, Ambien, and fentanyl patches, uh, but I choked that back up um, and, and just kind of was just beside myself. What was going on and, and having no idea um, how, how to even think, you know, and the doctors just keep telling me, well, you have nothing to do. So just you know, if you're feeling this way, take this. If you're feeling that way, take that. And I did that. Uh, so I'll fast forward to um, my wife uh, back in 2015 came to me and mentioned to me, you know, it's, it's what you're on. It's the drugs you're taking. I thought, no way. You know, I'm listening to, to these doctors. They wouldn't point me in the wrong direction. And she's like, well, why don't you try giving medical cannabis a try? And I was just, I was beside myself. I was like, I'm not going to sit around getting high, doing drugs. Um, but that led me to looking into what I was taking and, and realizing I was taking, you know, the, the best heroin money could buy synthetically made uh, opioid in, in fentanyl and oxycodone. Um, so, you know, wanted to try it uh, first started in, in the illicit market because I've got my card and no dispensaries were open. So I was going to mall parking lots <laughs> and, and buying bags off of, off of people because I was just so desperate. Um, then finally, a dispensary opened up. I got on a regimen and within five months, I had off, gotten off of all my medications, you know, off all the opioids. Um, and immediately after that was then uh, punished by the VA for, for doing that. You know, I had been told, like I said in the beginning, we have all these medications. We'll find one that works for you. I happened to find one that worked for me that wasn't there. So, um, you know, actions were taken against me. I became a spokesperson for Yes on Four in Massachusetts um, to help pass legalization because I saw it as another entry point into someone being able to access cannabis that doesn't want a card, doesn't want to be registered as a patient, but still still needs access. So I, I was a spokesperson for that. And for that, the VA came and took away half of my benefits and said, um, you know, you're better now. I'm like, I'm t all I'm doing is talking. I, I got out of bed, you know, and now I'm better. Okay. Um, but I had a, uh, I had my state Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren send a letter of inquiry uh, to the VA. And magically after, uh, after she did that, uh, within six months, all my benefits were reinstated. Somehow I didn't have to go through any sort of appeals process or anything like you usually have to do. Um, and that was because, you know, I had been getting mixed messages from the, from the VA saying it was because I wasn't going to appointments, 
I asked for that in writing. I got something else in writing that was that wasn't true. Um, it was able to prove that. So, you know, the VA has come a little ways in their acceptance of cannabis, where now we're told we can't have our benefits taken from us. Um, but, you know, even the physicians there don't trust that. I have a new physician this year, primary care doctor. He's very supportive of, of my cannabis use, supportive of other veterans, told me he knows lots of people, um, but said he wasn't going to put it in the system that I was using it because he didn't want anything to happen to me. You know, and I'm just, I was blown away because back in October, uh, the VA had an event and asked me to speak about cannabis and paid me an honorarium. So I'm like, here I am. My doctor's afraid to put it in the system. And that same system is paying me to talk ab about it. So it was just, it, it's so mixed up. And it's it's oxymoron. So much, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's so much confusion there. And it just needs to be, you know, really looked at. Yes, it doesn't fit in an alcohol box. It doesn't fit in a prescription medical box. It doesn't have to fit in a box. It's its own thing. You know, like every other substance we use, there's risks with it. But when you're talking about the veteran segment of society, we're, we're pretty good at risk mitigation. You know, we're walking streets and in, in, in backwoods of countries with firearms and like you were saying, the most, you know, technologically advanced weaponry. But when I get home, this plant, isn't safe for me. It just it doesn't make sense for for any veteran or really any person to have to be illegally healed. You know, which we see so much. You're finding illegal healing that makes no sense, none whatsoever. Yeah, I, I'm looking at the chat room and I'm seeing a lot of people uh, echoing a lot of things that all of you uh, are talking about. Um, and one one of the things that are, are somebody from Louisiana, Andy from Louisiana, chats in. You know, used to have call-ins. Now they chat in. <laughs> Anyway, uh, he's talking about not being allowed even to grow it. And you know, there's this green wave going on right now. We're, we're seeing reform bills being introduced in legislatures in different states all over the United States. And it's the issue of the home grow. And here in Massachusetts, I think they kind of got it right because they gave adults uh, six plants per adult, uh, 12 if you have two adults in a dwelling. Um, and yet, you know, you look at the proposal, the, the law that just became happened in New Jersey, no home grow. How do you how do you guys feel about the opportunity to actually be able to grow this stuff, especially if you need the medicine? And uh, I know I can't uh, Jimmy, call on Jimmy, anybody here. Jimmy, but Jimmy wants to, go ahead. Throw that at Max. All right, Max, I'm throwing so, it at you. All right. So so my deal is I only found cannabis four years ago. Um, I, like Steven, I was a 20 year opiate patient. Um, I was at the point where I was on hospice level fentanyl patches that were literally killing me minute by minute. Um, fentanyl became part of the news every day in, you know, 2015, 2016. And I started looking into what I'd been given. And it scared the death out of me. And, you know, I grew up in a, in a family, in a household where there were no drugs. You know, um, <clears throat> I, I, I had Thanksgivings where family didn't expect me to make it to Christmas. Um, 16 months of detox, 16 months. Um, March 4th, I'll be a thousand days clean. The way that I was able to do that is home growth. I can't afford wheat. <laughs> wheat is too expensive. You know, when, when I first went looking, you know, I, I went looking on Craigslist because I didn't know anybody that smoked wheat. Um, you know, so home grow is the most important and, and dear to my heart. Um, it saved my life to, to, to have a state where weed is legal and to not be able to grow even a minimal amount. You know, Massachusetts, the rec laws allow enough cannabis for most medical patients. You know, the six plants at a time will provide for most of what people will consume. Um, 
I'm lucky. Somebody fought 10 years ago for my right to home grow. Um, it needs to be expanded. It, the, okay. it, there's no, no doubt in my mind that expanded home grow saves lives, period. Uh, even if it's just in giving a veteran something to do, you know, something to care for, something to think about other than shit. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I got gotcha. you. Uh, I, I want to throw this out again to the to the room. Uh, access to capital to launch businesses. Uh, Roland, I'm going to I think this is a good one for you to handle here. Um, talk a little bit about how challenging it is. If you are a veteran, it's not like you've got access to all this capital. You know, you, you try to try to do something. How how can we help the veterans that want to get into the cannabis business? Roland? Well, you know, first of all, I, I'd like to address the, the last gentleman. Um, the way that we feel is we believe that veterans should get their medicine for free. They should never have to take out of pocket to get their medicine. And that's why in our, our you grow facilities, um, all, all of our master growers are veterans. And so they're taking care of the crops for the state licensed patients. Um, they are all part of, we are all linked together through what are called replicating websites. So everything that we do is trademarked veteran owned businesses, regardless what aspect they get into. And then we have, through our replicating websites, we have a platform that allows investors, especially social purpose investors who want to invest in something that makes them feel good, that they're doing something good. And we believe veterans are probably the demographic that has been the most abused, hurt, and are suffering. That's why 22 die a day um, that want to help them. And so all we're doing is saying, if when you get on our platform, you will see businesses, their business plans, their stories, who they are. And if you want to invest in that particular industry, we will set up that meeting. But we just believe that, you know, our veterans need their medicine. We need to get them off of their, the toxic drugs they're getting. And we need to teach them this industry. It's historic. It's a hundred billion dollar industry coming in the next 10 years that affects so many different facets of how it could be used. And so why would we not say, wow, here's an opportunity for our veterans to get a better life. Let's train them. But if we don't heal them, if we don't deal with those PTSD, the depression, the anxiety, all of those things that make them very insecure, then we're not going to have good entrepreneurs. And so we just believe that we got to heal them. We got to get them off the drugs. We need to use the cannabinoids to rebalance them and then train them and mentor them into a business. And there are so many businesses, ancillary businesses that are coming. So why wouldn't we give our veterans that opportunity in the interim, be able to have them getting their medicine for free? Absolutely. And I'd, Rama, I'd, I know, I, I know I'd, I'd love to chime in a bit about <laughs> this is your um, turn, girl. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd love to chime in about uh, especially investing into veterans as professionals and as entrepreneurs and as uh, leaders in the space. And that's exactly um, after working with Stephen on the Veterans Health and Medical Cannabis Study in 2019, as well as the uh, branded out communications and community development arm known as cannabis advancement series and anyone can check out the research in that project uh, uh, at cannabisadvancementseries.org. Uh, after working through that as a co-founder with Stephen and our colleague, Dr. Mary McNabb, it was so clear that uh, veterans really coming from a place of service, which was my experience in hospice prior to cannabis, was an instant connection that I had with um, Stephen and uh, and being able to invest into um, providing a voice and giving uh, the story of veterans when it comes to their experience with 
feeling well, improving their quality of life, returning back to their family, um, as well as contributing to the development of their local communities. Uh, and specifically also with veterans contributing to advocacy, policy and legislative uh, legislative initiatives as well. And at Joint Venture & Co, we absolutely do value as an ancillary service, as a, um, as a growth agency that focuses on branding and communications, that was really um, a vital important for us. So we absolutely value veterans being at the table, uh, veterans having a voice, um, veterans really leading the charge as to how this, uh, the access and the choice is unfolding for veterans locally, regionally, and nationally. So I just, Stevens contributed so much to the culture of service uh, in any way he's uh, participated in conversation as a selectman in the, in the town of Uxbridge and as a consultant with us at Joint Venture & Co. His, uh, and also my experience here with Stanley, <laughs> uh, who was also contributing to as an editorial board advisor for the Cannabis Patient Care um, magazine, which is a, a, a sister brand for um, cannabis science and technology, like even, and Stephen's on the board as well, to be able to contribute to the ongoing dialogue and conversation of how veterans are affecting the care we're receiving, uh, product innovation, campaign development, uh, education, all of that. I'm, I'm, I'm just being able to think outside of the box and not being afraid to have these vulnerable conversations with legislators uh, is really important as well as academics and uh, researchers. So I, I definitely here for me personally, daughter of a veteran, family veteran, friends and family and veterans, uh, investing into veterans and their families is an absolute no brainer. Uh, and you can, as veterans, you can also use your voice to advocate uh, when it comes to policy and legislation. And uh, we find that very, very valuable and it does impact systemic and sustainable change. And uh, I hope anyone who's listening, if you're plant touching or ancillary, that you absolutely find the value of investing into legislative and advocacy affairs, um, especially when they're a veteran. And uh, if you need any assistance on that um, and any advice, consulting, strategy, communications, definitely please reach out to us at Joint Venture & Co. And Stephen will represent appropriately. That's great. And by and the Stanley. way, the chat room is filled with people from all over the country. It's obvious that people do care about you veterans, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas. And that's just on the page that I'm on on now. Um, David Rabinovitz, I want to bring you in here. Uh, first of all, Ryan Cohen is the only one that Ryan's hasn't- Ryan's back with us. Yes. Well, David's with us, I know, and, I, and Ryan Cohen is here as well. Yes. Um, but David, I know you are active in the social equity program, uh, trying to help um, those who have been most impacted on the war on drugs and getting access to capital, learning how to build a business plan, getting them ready to go into business. Um, are the same things available to veterans? I guess that's the question I'm asking you. So it, it, that program is, uh, if veterans qualify, they get in, but they don't get in because they're veterans. Um, for getting into business, if you're a veteran, you do get into an expedited line, not the priority line, which is the really fast line, but the expedited line moves pretty quickly as well. So there's a lot of licensing benefits there. Um, but, but let's stick with more of what's going on with, with the veteran stuff. But let's take a moment, Jimmy, let's Ryan, you, you came in here. Anything you want to say to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Thanks for inviting me back. Yep. I, uh, I was on last week and had so much fun. I beg and prodded to come back this week. So, uh, <laughs> I'm Ryan Cohen. I'm the founder of uh, Top Shelf Canisaurs. Uh, um, <clears throat> Selectman Man Billy, nice to see you. He's uh, you, <clears throat> from Uxbridge, where my facility is. And we're looking forward to giving back to the local and veteran community. Um, I, I was in the 82nd Airborne. I got injured on a jump uh, 13 days before 9-11. Um, had a traumatic brain injury, had back surgery. My unit shipped out without me. I got really depressed. Um, and my life sucked for, for a while. And uh, cannabis was one of the real uh, lifelines that I had. 
and <clears throat> I got in trouble for it. So um, thus the social equity status. Um, I was helping out a friend or two, including myself uh, back in 2006 in the wrong Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Virginia. And um, unfortunately, I've been a felon for the last 12 years because of it. Um, 2021 is supposed to be good news for me because I believe Virginia is going to be doing me a solid uh, and they're gonna be either bringing it down to a misdemeanor or expunging it all together. So um, up until the social equity program was introduced, there wasn't any bones thrown my way, uh, pun intended. So, um, you know, it's the, the irony is not lost on me, but the social equity program has been really instrumental in getting my business going. And there's a lot of advantages, uh, like da David mentioned, uh, being a veteran, veteran does help a little bit. Um, hopefully there'll be some more policy changes to um, kind of boost that up a little bit here in Mass. But I'm happy to be here. Um, I've also been a home grower for years, so I can weigh in on that a little bit. Um, honestly, you know, kind of weighing in on what Max said, um, sometimes the ability to, to, to grow your own medicine um, can really save lives, like Max said. Um, a lot of people can't afford 100, 200 bucks a week to, um, to, to keep things rolling. And to take that away, like certain states have done with their rollouts, I think is, um, you know, irresponsible at best. So um, big proponent of, of home grow. I, I really like the new legislation that came forth um, with the uh, five, 500 square feet of canopy. Um, I think that's a lot better than 12 plants. And um, I, think, I think it's a great law that I hope goes through. How many plants, anybody want to tell us how many plants you could get in a 500 square foot canopy? About 20 lights. So uh, 20 really big plants or up to 50 or 60. Wow. Easily, this, even more. Now so. see in, Mich in Michigan, we have had a very generous and that's actually what helped me um, start O2 Vape is that I, we, you're allowed 12 plants but you can also be a caregiver for up to five people. So you can have full card. If you have a full card, you can have 72 plants and you can be a caregiver. So you can grow for other people, such as, you know, which is a good way. And we were, we were doing that. And then you could, where, where they messed up the system now though. And I think just to touch on something about like why the states don't let people grow or don't give them the even six plants is because, you know, let's face it, this is a big business. As someone mentioned, a hundred billion dollar industry in the next few years. They And there's so many of these humongous, humongous multi-state operators that they don't, it's the same way that they don't want you growing it for yourself in some respects, I feel. And I'm not, I mean, I work with multi-state operators, but, you know, they want you going to the pharmacy and getting your prescriptions every month. Well, they don't want you growing it for yourself. They want you to go to the dispensary and pay your, you know, $600 for an ounce where, you know, I mean, that, I think that's part of it, too, why some of the states don't give the plant rights. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, I, I work with people in, in big commercial grows, but, you know, I think that that's part of it. But myself growing and growing for other people and being their caregiver, you know, was what helped us. And we helped, you know, I grew, had a couple of my patients were veterans as well, but maybe that in some states for the veterans that can't get their medicine if they, or they don't want to grow, because it is not all buds and glory growing as anyone that's on here grows knows that maybe there's a network, something that can be done like that, form some kind of a network where people still have the right to grow and then can grow or become a caregiver or take their overages or, or whatever and, and do something with it like that. But also there really isn't like a ton of access to seeds, clones, nope. nurseries. So nope. we, that also too, for like the state of Virginia, it would be great if they had that language in there and the infrastructure and the supply chain set up where veterans and everyone could have access to um, all of that. Uh, Cause you can set up the grow and all the lights and da 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 da, but it's, also a process to pop a seed, make sure it's like a male or a female and then go through that process. So um, I would like to see that legislatively speaking, um, be uh, anyone having access to 
the plan at different stages. So and I don't think I don't think people understand that a lot of our, you know, a lot of these state laws coming through, these are these are not being written by legislators. These are being written by lobbyists that are paid by these companies protecting, you know, their that industry. So if you're not out there doing it, then your the your opposition is doing it. So for for everyone that's out there, it's like we all have that ability to present legislation ourselves. So get out there and be advocating for home growth. It, it's it's hugely important. There's therapeutic value to it for those that have the physical ability, space, and everything to be able to do it. There, there's so much value in it, you know, and, and it gives people a routine. You might not have anything to do a day, but you do have to go and check your plants. You do have to water them. You do have to go in there and make sure everything's good. So it, it kind of puts people on, on a bit of a schedule and, and you're responsible for something and it gives you purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Taking the ability for people to grow it away, it, 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 does, it doesn't make any sense. That's not legalization. That's you know, right. setting up a profit structure. You know, right. it, it, people have to be able to grow it. Yeah. So decrim I, it. Decrim it federally. Decrim decrim it, right but sometimes, I mean, and again, I'm not, I don't, but, you know, along with full legalization, makes the way, I think that sometimes can make the way way more for big pharma, big tobacco and big right. alcohol. I mean, so that full legalization, it's just my opinion. And again, I just don't know if I think sometimes that's the full answer because I mean, they just, they just, you know, you've already got big alcohol that's come in. Um, Altria, which is the tobacco, the nicotine side and tobacco yeah. spent $1.8 billion dollars you know, to buy into it. They, they just came out in Forbes magazine. They want to be the biggest cannabis company in the world. And they're just, yeah, no, I mean, legalization. decrim de is essential before we go exactly. on a full. Correct. I, and I don't and know about you the guys. most marginalized groups here that are being disproportionately thrown right. into jail, like black and brown communities that need yep. to end. Hey, is anybody confident that the that the federal government would get it right after what they did with hemp in t a couple of years ago? They still can't figure out what to do with hemp. In and this they're country. after the hemp. They're after the hemp right now. The DEA is after hemp. Right. And right. what's you know? It so is, they're. But it's the time other big to deschedule. Thing, it's time it is, to deschedule it. it. That that. But if that's, you deschedule it, if you deschedule it though, Jimmy, you're giving in big pharma right right in. We need a decrim, decrim first, and then he's, let's talk about let's talk about other stuff after that. The money we're spending right. and perpetuating prohibition and stigma, especially on our marginalized communities, which is not exclusive. Uh, I mean, it is inclusive of the veteran community, which is very diverse. Uh, so absolutely, I when, when I was a when I was doing toxicology, people would ask me because I was out setting up, you know, trying to keep the pill mills out of there, trying to keep doctors compliant. And they would ask me, they'd say, Dana, what are your thoughts about cannabis? And I'm not in the weed closet. I'll talk to anybody at Costco. I still run into doctors and stuff that I call and they're like, what do you do? And it's funny. Cause I'll say, well, I'm in the cannabis industry. And they'll go, what? I'm in the cannabis. What? I, I'm in the pot industry. And they go, Oh, okay. But they would ask me, what are your thoughts on that? And I, and I said, even, I still feel that way. If someone has to drop, we all know the term drop. If you have to drop, if someone, and I used to tell the docs, this is my opinion. If they have THC in their system and they're still compliant with their drugs, their levels for hydrocodone, because there truly is, even though a lot of people had problems with it, there is truly people that still do need other medicines besides cannabis. So even though we all hate Vicodin and we all hate hydrocodone and we all hate the oxys, there still are people that cannabis is not enough cancer patients, you know, things like that. We all have family members, you know, not everybody does get addicted to it. Certainly don't get me started. I could talk for hours on how the drug company did that. I lived through it. I fought against Purdue Pharma and stuff like that. But anyway, is that um, if you are still having to take a pain pill and if I would tell the doctors, if they are compliant with their levels and the THC is in there, leave them alone. Leave them alone, especially if they're in a patient in a state like Michigan that you could have a medical card, but, or whatever other state. But I said, if they, if you're doing a test on them and they have nothing in their system, then they're selling their drugs. 
you know, and they, they're popping for heroin or methadone or Suboxone or whatever, then they're selling them. But if they, cause sometimes that can also still, maybe you only need to take one pain pill a day, but you augment it with smoking a joint, you know, you might need something stronger. So I think there's, but the descheduling you're opening up, you already have epidolics. They just, GW Pharma just sold for how many hundreds of millions of dollars? I mean, 0.2 billion, I thought. Well, yeah, billion. They're just opening the door for more, for more of the big pharma to come in and control and big tobacco. So that's, I'm, well, that's why we, we have to get out there and advocate and yeah. Stanley, I know you're doing some big stuff in the state of Georgia and that's positioned you as from advocating continuously, but even as a professional, as you launched Stanley group, because I know we were talking about how advocacy experience leads to professional, uh, employment and how those are valuable transferable skills from being an advocate to now being um, in consulting and and management. Absolutely. Um, I found myself in that, like in the fire, because at first I didn't even know I was an advocate. I was like, I'm just passionate about helping people. And Stephen, it's so good to see your face, my brother. I want to tell you that I love you, ladies and gentlemen. So when I first got sick in 2014, doctors told me, you may have six months, you may have six weeks, you may have a year. You're being non-compliant by refusing to go to radiation, low doses radiation therapy. My argument was, if you don't know what's going on, why would I go to radiation? I knew nothing about the cannabis advocacy groups. I knew nothing about other states and programs. So when I couldn't find any answers, I joined social media. And one of the first people I found was Stephen Mandeli. And when I saw him holding up a poster, outside his capital. I was like, hold up, hold up. This guy's a veteran with a service dog walking on a cane at his capital uh, advocating. I was like, I started messaging him and I would make posters and hold them up to respond to his posters. And that's what I was like, you know what? I'm getting off the bench and I'm getting in the game. And my experience at the state capital, you know, cause they often introduce me as Dr. Atkins. And I always re- come back and say, I am not a doctor. I'm not a physician. I've never announced myself as one, but I do collaborate with some of the best ones in the world. It put me in a position because if you're going to be in any any industry, just like a game, you need to know the rules of the game to be effective. And in cannabis, if you don't know the policies, procedures, rules and regulation and who is writing those, you're already behind. Yes, you can get a license application, but you don't even know how the program runs. And so for me being in there, going to subcommittees, going to Senate hearings and testifying and really learning the interworking, learning that language in these bills are so imperative where they say shall versus has the ability to, you know, may versus shall. Those are two totally different things. And on the decrim, thank you so much. And for the um, comment you made in regards to black and brown people, I have been a part of three successful decriminalization ordinances here in Georgia. My favorite, the city of Atlanta. It took us 16 months to do it. And what helped us push for decriminalization in the South was that Georgia has more people on governmental supervision than any other states. One in 13 people are either on probation or parole in the state of Georgia. Well, the ACLU did a demographic research with the city of Atlanta police, and they discovered that amongst all the cannabis-related arrests in Atlanta, 91% were African-American males between the age of 18 and 34 when they, they would interview officers and you would have officers who would openly admit off record, um, off out of uniform, that it depends on what area of Atlanta I you know, it, in, incur that, that suspect. It depends on, is it in Brookhaven or is it in zone six? Are they driving their mom's uh, G5 or are they driving their dad's old dots and pickup truck you know, with a, with a donut on the tires? So there is a, a big issue in regards to decriminalization and really how we look at this as a business. Um, I was on a call earlier with a legislator out of the Bahamas, and they're getting ready to introduce their medical bill. Um, they're looking to take the pharmacy approach similar to the governmental style of Ontario. And to allude back to one more fa- point that I heard here, Medications versus cannabis. I've been in a long battle with the VA. I was hospitalized three times last year. Ended up having surgery on New Year's Eve and going back in for another surgery on April 29th. It has been a, the biggest battle because I've been opioid free for five years, but due to some physical things that were out of my control last year, it came to the point where I actually finally needed them. 
And due to the alternative wellness therapy programs that I've completed, the EVP program for alternative wellness, the VA was shocked. Like, wait a minute, you're our anti-opioid, dude. Why do you want pain pills? You know, and I'm telling them, though, it alleviates and assists with some of the signs and symptoms, but it's not the end all be all. And so what I think for those physicians who are prescribing those medications and then having those patients drop for your analysis, we need to have an educational conversation in regard to a polypharmacy approach. This is not a one tiered. We have to take a 360 polypharmacy approach if we really want to see the efficacy of these programs. That's why I said, if you have to have that, you know, if you're, t- and, and, and the other thing that sucks, and I saw it for the years that I did the toxicology, is that even if, if they say to you, okay, Stanley, we're going to give you a couple, but we want you THC free. So now you're going to make you wait six, seven, eight weeks for the THC to come out of your system because it can take, depending on how it metabolizes, it can take that long to come out of your system. And so that's not another, that's not fair either, but they, they definitely can augment each other. It isn't one or the other. Not every patient is the same. And I think that there has to be a lot of the education with that as far as that it, it, it can, it can go, they can go together. And it's not, you had said earlier, it is not, I, I, I will absolutely lose my, I will just lose it when people say it's the gateway drug. Oh, cannabis is going to lead to opiates. I saw, I worked during the opiate explosion. It had nothing to do with cannabis. That's right. It's an exit it's drug. Like it's, it's an exit drug. It's an Straight exit up. drug. Everybody in this room recognizes yeah. that. It's, it's, it's convincing the rest of the world, which is what we have to try to do. And it's what we try to do. Uh, here at Pro Cannabis Media, being able to give you guys a forum to, you know, share your frustrations, uh, express your stories, and and share it with with peers from all over the country. I'm thrilled. Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. Um, we, I mean, we've heard from Georgia. A- Georgia's in the house. Georgia's right. In the house. That's right. Right. We've got, it's awesome. So look guys, um, we've kind of run out of time, uh, which I feel always horrible about when, when we get going with these open forums. But um, I do want to ask you all, if you want to hang in for 12 minutes after this show to watch the We Talk News for this week. Um, we have a, a special report on New Jersey and we get some reaction from people in New Jersey who have been in the trenches, um, you know, fighting for legalization in that state for three years, if not longer. Um, And all of you who are are advocated for this, uh, you know, I salute you um, and I appreciate you taking the time to share your stories. Ann and Stephen are very special. You guys, anytime, you know that you've got a forum here and a friend uh, with me, you you can use me in whatever capacity. Thank you, Pro Cannabis Media. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for sharing your platform to help veterans. You bet. You bet. Anytime, guys. And we'll do it again, uh, because I, I think that uh, we could even extend this for a couple more hours and get more stories from more veterans and, and their own um, journeys through the world and using and cannabis. So I just want to thank everybody uh, on behalf of my staff, Dan French, who directs it, Isabel Turner, who's the producer, and everybody here at Pro Cannabis Me to remember it's a whole new world of weed out there. So please use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye, everyone. Call Bye, everyone. Thanks, Dave. webinars Thanks, Dave. to a whole Green. new level. New Jersey's Governor Nurse Phil Murphy Mark. signs the adult use hey. legalization bill. We've got reaction. Ex-CEO of a weed delivery service in California pleads guilty to bank fraud. Deborah Borchart has that story. Shipping of vape pen products will become an issue in the next 30 days, threatening an entire industry. All that and more on We Talk News this week. We are Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. Our top story has been anticipated since November when New Jersey voters flocked to the polls to vote in adult use and sale of legal cannabis. This week, Governor Phil Murphy signed the bill and tweeted out, this week we made history by reforming a decades-old approach to marijuana that failed the meaning of justice at every level. 
Let's continue building on the progress and move forward together. So now the big question facing many New Jersey residents is, when will the first stores open? Many advocates were frustrated with the delays in moving this forward even since November, but this is supposed to be the beginning of a huge $1 billion market. Three plus years we've been waiting for this bill to be signed, so it's really historic. I'm really relieved. Um, it, it's really been a great week for me and for the people in New Jersey. So um, I now the work begins, though. It's, you know, now we roll up our sleeves and we have to get the CRC being uh, finalized and we have to start getting some regulations in place before we can open up to new licenses. And also worth mentioning our biggest lawsuit, our class action lawsuit from our last cannabis round settled. And that's been going on for a year and a half, which was also holding up the licensing process. So in one week, we had two big wins. We had a settled lawsuit and a bill signed. But overall, you know, it's a good day. You know, I'm relieved. It's a good time. You know, I thought this would be done a little sooner, but, you know, all good things come to those who wait. New Jersey will still have to wait to open their first adult use recreational dispensary. Give it at least nine months uh, to a year, depending on how fast you really can get more dispensaries online. Uh, with a lot of products. We have a population of 9 million with 15 dispensaries. To give you a sense of uh, perspective, the state of Colorado has about half our population and the city of Denver has 400 dispensaries. <laughs> so if we're talking about ratios here, it's absolutely absurd. We cannot serve our population right now. So the Arizona model, while it would be great, and I do hope we grandfather in our dispensaries, I do believe we would. I've heard nothing saying we won't. And that's the quickest way to get this adult use out the door. Um, they're going to be massively overwhelmed and the, the access just isn't there. So we need to get this licensing round going and going fast. So now all eyes turn to New York, where the battle over legalization is right in the middle of Governor Andrew Cuomo's budget. That battle is ongoing. In the meantime, Let's go to New York for the Green Market Report with Deborah Borchardt. Deborah? This week, James Patterson, the former CEO of California Cannabis Company Ease, pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit bank fraud, and that's according to a report at Law 360. Now, the plan was a scheme to deceive banks into processing more than $100 million worth of credit card and debit card payments for cannabis purchases. You may recall that Visa and MasterCard will not work with cannabis companies because it is still federally illegal. So all of these transactions were committing bank fraud. Now it's expected that Patterson is working with prosecutors to testify against the other defendants in an effort to lower his punishment. Privately held multi-state cannabis company Parallel and the SPAC Sarah's Acquisition Corp have entered into an agreement that would result in Parallel becoming a public company. This could happen this summer in 2021. The deal values Parallel at $1.8 billion with an expected net revenue of $447 million in 2021. Acreage Holdings sold Acreage Florida to Red, White & Bloom brands for $60 million. Now you may remember that Acreage has said it was going to scale back from its initial plan to be in as many states as possible. Instead, they're just going to focus on nine states. And that's the big news this week. I'm Deborah Borchart from the Green Marker Report for We Talk News. Now, there's been a lot of action lately on the legalization front in many states. We're going to start in New York. We already talked a little bit about their governor, Andrew Cuomo, who's building a fund. Sure enough, he's trying to use social justice as a rallying cry to build out his plan to launch a legal adult use cannabis market. He's now put on an amendment to his original plan by adding a $100 million social equity fund for delivery services, workforce education, and the refinement of past criminal charges. In New Hampshire, the House of Representatives there has approved a legalization bill that will allow personal use, growing, and gifting of cannabis, but not commercial sales. Getting it past their governor, Chris Sununo, will still be the biggest hurdle in the live free or die state. 
In another New England state, Connecticut, their governor, Ned Lamont, has introduced an adult use legalization plan with sales to begin May of 2022. But it too has a long way to go before it becomes law. In Alabama, yes, Alabama, the legislature there has passed a bill that approves a medicinal marijuana law with 20 medical conditions that would qualify you for your card. The North Dakota House of Representatives have passed a bill to legalize adult use of cannabis, and it now goes to that Senate. Meanwhile, the battle continues in South Dakota, as their governor, Kristi Noem, is not a fan of the voters' wishes there, who passed both a medical and an adult use question in the November election. Now, advocates are negotiating a compromise while the court challenges continue in South Dakota. Now, it seems to me there's a lot of political movement on cannabis issues in many states, while the federal government continues to focus on the COVID relief fund. No such issue in Canada, where that country continues to have a vibrant legal cannabis market. Here's MJ Biz Daily's International Bureau reporter, Solomon Israel, with the Canadian Cannabis Report. Solomon? I'm Solomon Israel from Marijuana Business Daily International, and this is the Weed Talk News Canadian Cannabis Report. Canada's Government Statistics Agency has released the grand total for legal sales of recreational cannabis in 2020. Annual sales were 2.6 billion Canadian dollars, or about 2.1 billion US dollars. In dollar terms, that's 120% more recreational cannabis than Canadians bought in 2019. December sales of adult use marijuana in Canada picked back up after a sluggish November. And Canadian marijuana producer Canopy Growth is looking to fill up its war chest. Canopy has filed a preliminary prospectus that would allow it to raise up to $2 billion by issuing new securities over a 25 month period. The company had 825 million Canadian dollars of cash on hand at the end of 2020. You can read those stories and more at mjbizdaily.com. I'm Solomon Israel for Marijuana Business Daily. Here's this week's factoid courtesy of MJ Biz Daily's Factbook. Did you know that for every single dollar that is spent in the legal cannabis market, $2.50 gets injected into the economy. That fact and more available in the MJ Biz Daily Factbook available on their website, mjbizdaily.com. Now you might remember the last COVID relief bill had a clause attached that might have a devastating effect on the vape market here in the U.S. Now, it's okay if you missed it since it was on page 5,136 of that bill. I got up to about 3,500 and packed it in. No, I'm only kidding. The Preventing Online Sales of E-Cigarettes to Children Act that basically will stop the delivery of all components and elements used in any vaporizing device. UPS and FedEx say they will ease delivering vape products beginning in March and on April 5th, respectively. The U.S. Postal Service will cease residential delivery of vape products on April 26th. These restrictions will quite possibly end the vaping industry in the U.S. And needless to say, that industry is pretty upset. On Friday's Green Rush Live show at 4 on our PCM network, we will interview Dana Shoked, CEO of O2 Vape, who will explain how this happened. It could have devastating effects on this part of the industry and for those who use a vape for their medicinal titration. This is a big deal. So remember to like, share, and subscribe to Pro Cannabis Media and also tune in on Friday for the Green Rush Live. For now, that'll do it for this week's Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Ben Shower, New England rep for Salient Video Management Systems. Let me tell you what makes us different in the security space. We're your trusted advisors for all your security needs. I know how complicated the regulations are in cannabis, and working with Salient Systems will be the polar opposite of that. I give free consultations and we'll walk you through every step of the process so that you can get what you need at the price you can afford. We're robust, we're simple and scalable. We're Salient Systems, your solutions to all your security needs. Please contact me at the information below, and I'm looking forward to being your trusted advisor.
Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of Pro Cannabis Media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. Pro Cannabis Media programming is available live and on demand on our Facebook page at Pro Canna Media, on Instagram at Pro Cannabis Media, on LinkedIn, also at Pro Cannabis Media, on YouTube and YouTube Live on Pro Cannabis Media, Twitter at Pro Canna Media, and on twitch.tv backslash pro cannabis media so like share and subscribe to all of our content newsletters and shows live or on demand we are pro cannabis media